Sarah Cunningham is a, a, a distinguished player, teacher, ensemble performer, soloist on the Viola da Gamba. She's an old friend of mine and she's a member of the faculty at the Juilliard School and has taught in many other places too. And I'm really happy that she's here to talk to me today. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Tom, it's good to be here. <laughs> It's very nice to see you. Um, there are lots of things we can talk about and lots of things we probably shouldn't talk about, but uh, our mutual interest here, I think, is coming to understand how we got to where we are in the early music or historical performance or whatever it is. Could you just tell us a little bit about your own background in music? Uh, how, did you, how did you get started in music? And do you remember the moment when you turn towards whatever this early music thing is? Tell us about it. I sure do. <laughs> I come from a musical family and I'm sitting here right now um, in the middle of the, what's left of my, which is a lot, of my parents' collection because they started their marriage with the wedding gift of a, an antique harpsichord which we still have. And they went on from there to collect instruments and to play them through the entire 60 odd years of their marriage. And um, so, but amateurs. So my mother was a musicologist and my father was a mathematician, but they met playing string quartets and they progressed to playing vile consorts, which they always did. And I, uh, you know, everybody had to play an instrument. Everybody, I wanted to play instruments because it was obviously a fun thing that everybody did. And I played the piano and I played the cello, um, but I didn't particularly like to practice. Um, and in fact, I didn't. I mean, in through high school, I didn't want to stop lessons, but I practiced literally an hour a week mm. before my, before my uh, so I never dreamed I would do it professionally. But I also learned the viol. I started playing bass viol in the family consort when I was around 12 or 13, and that was fun. And then I went with my parents in the summer to various early music workshops in Provincetown and uh, Wyndham College in Putney, Vermont. And that was fun. Mm -hmm. And it was especially fun. I remember when I played my first solo in a student concert, I played Ortiz Richarda Quarta, exactly. I remember the exact piece, and people were saying, "Oh, you're talented!" And I was like, "What?" I mean, <laughs> it came as a huge surprise. I don't think I had terribly wonderful cello teachers, and I don't think I really got, you know, much good feedback. But that's a little goes to your head a bit, you know. Once, once people. And then, but I still didn't think that much about it. But when I went to college, I went to Radcliffe, Harvard. It was already the same as going to Harvard at that point. And um, Jan Lyman Silberger was teaching Viola de Gamba at the Longy School. So I took lessons with her and never looked at the cello once for a long, long time. And um, I also by a fluke met uh, Marlene Montgomery who was kind of, so there, these are the two poles of my um, being lured into music as a full-time thing. Let's go back to Marlene in a minute, because yeah. in my experience, she's an enormously important and influential people, uh, person in the Boston area for a long time. But it sounds as though you, you didn't sort of have the concept of early music growing, growing up. You grew up with a harpsichord and a gamba consort in your house. Nobody ever said, early music is a separate kind of thing that only weirdos deal with. Oh, that's not quite true. It is was a separate kind of thing. We listened to uh, recordings in the New York Pro Musica. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't just music, but Renaissance art was the best. My dad at one point maintained that anything after 1500 was really getting very decadent. <laughs> And I was kind of brainwashed with all that. We did not listen to romantic music, although my mother liked Brahms and taught Brahms. She mm -hmm. was more broad-minded, but in the context of our family, it was early music was it. And we were very, um, you know, really pretty snooty about other things. So it was sort of early, early music from the beginning. Yeah. It wasn't but, a sort of a, a conversion experience or anything. It was always there. But this is interesting, Tom, because it is my words are very strongly in the amateur 
um, tradition and side of, of the early music revival. And that was and, a very important part of it, wasn't it? When you talked absolutely. about those uh, workshops, the summer workshops that we went to, yeah. it was a great phenomenon of, of amateurs going to workshops and teaching and performing. And there was a whole kind of culture of early music that existed outside of conservatories and universities. And there still is. Yeah. That is not, that is not wound down in the slightest. And the Viola da Gamba Society of America, for instance, is an extremely strong organization because it embraces the amateurs and the professionals and the uh, teachers and the performers and, and in a very strong way. But I got bitten, I, you know, it was partly or so I reacted against my academic family by dropping out of college and going to music school. I mm -hmm. just decided, whoa, this academic stuff is just, it was too easy almost. I always did very well in school without mm -hmm. trying. And I think I wanted more of a challenge. Wow. And, um, but having said all that, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, uh, there. Um, coming from that amateur background and not having practiced as a child, was a huge thing that I had to like kick myself away from. I really had to push off hard from that, trying to get myself to another level. And um, so while my parents were upset when I dropped out of college, sorry, this is straying a bit from your- your no, it's personal, your, okay. of, of early music. I had to learn to practice and I had to learn what was needed by uh, falling on my face over and over and over again in public. That was really, um, that's, that feels like that's the story of how I learned to play and that which one could do in those days. You can't necessarily do that anymore yeah. because there were so few of us doing it. And if you could really play at all, you could make a career. I'm, I may be exaggerating that. The standards have gone up tremendously. I, yes, yeah. And so I was getting professional work before I could really play. And uh, it was, it's, it's hard doing it that way, but it's also wonderful. And um, Marlene was one of these all embracing sort of people as well. She was, an, she was a genius. She was a musical genius. And, Marlene uh, Montgomery, say Marlene something about Montgomery. her. Marlene Montgomery, and she, her group was called the Quadrivium. And um, it was a complete mix of, um, people who could play beginners, amateurs, professionals. And she loved early music and the sounds that the instrument made. She didn't care too much about uh, scholarly research or how you were supposed to do it. She just really went by her ear and her heart and um, I, very, very formative for me because she taught um, like from, she was a recorder player. She didn't play the gamba, but she's one of my most important teachers. She's taught uh, every technique of every instrument starting from the breath and from your body awareness. And then also from acoustic, room acoustics and what sound actually does in a space. But then also believe so strongly that a concert isn't just a concert where you're showing what you can do needs to be a completely immersive experience for the audience and the performers and you're really all in it together and a very spiritual path as well and um, her programs were called things like a pilgrimage to birth and there would be cantigas and there would be all kinds of stuff and did you hear any of them tom i heard lots of them um and i was going to say all of the things you just mentioned are things that are not aspects of early music they're actually aspects of of real music making, about why we make music and why we listen to music, yeah? yeah. So everybody should have studied with Marlene yeah. Montgomery, but unfortunately, a lot of people didn't. A, well, thing I to... remember about, a thing I remember about her is that she spun off group after group after group, smaller groups, Live Oak, and, and there are all sorts of different other ensembles yeah. were, were created within, within the quadrivium, is that right? Yeah, uh, the voice of the turtle was yeah. the one that really went on for a long time, um, and there were groups that were less directly spawned by it. Now, my group at the time, which was formed with people I studied with in Holland, because after a few years at Longy, I'd had enough of that and uh, went off to The Hague to study with Wieland, 
Koken, and that's where I met Jean Lamont, Robert Hill, Marion Verbruggen, uh, Barbara Thornton, um, a lot of very illustrious names. But anyway, some of us, Jean and Robert and I formed a trio when we got back to New York. Uh, not New York, Boston, sorry. Why did I say New York? Uh, music for the general peace. And people are kind of, uh, that's a forgotten group. We put an awful lot into it for a long time. Not forgotten time. by me. I remember it with great pleasure. You guys were great. Well, you were a very important part because you put us in the way of that. Um, uh, I can't even remember the name of the foundation that gave us a big grant to do a collaborative thing with um, Castle Hill. Terrific. Which never happened because we got this, which was really something we'd never dreamed. I mean, it was 45 grand or something like that to do a concert series, which never happened because guess what? I was moving to London uh, to work with Monica Huggett and Jean was moving to Toronto to direct Taffa music and yeah. the history. And Robert was also moving to um, Europe where he, he hooked up with Reinhard Goebel. So it's right. like these, these um, you know, very historic names that there we were for a while and then all went off. It was again. a wonderful moment that you all came together and you played General Peace played, what, just a couple of years together, maybe, or a little seven bit more years. than that. Seven years. It might have been, even been eight. Mm -hmm. Because um, we came back from The Hague in 72, 73, and we all left in um, 81. Yeah. 1981. Gosh. And what happened to you after that, Sarah? You didn't stay in Boston forever, unfortunately. Unfortunately for Boston, I mean. No, I landed in London, and that was a really um, great move for me. I mean, Boston, we had, but there were starting to be Baroque orchestras. There was Banchetto Musicale, and then we went to New York and played with Concert Royal and so on. But there wasn't that much work. Right. And all the same people always got it. And you might remind people that what you call Banchetto Musicale is what changed its name to Boston Baroque, but it's the That's same right. band. The same band with, with yeah. Marty Perlman directing. But in, in uh, London, I was a smaller fish in a bigger pond, but there was just so much more happening. And of course, the 80s were a boom time in many ways, but not least for us because of the invention of the CD. So there was recording everything in order for it to be released on CD. And that just made a, made a huge difference. And I formed another trio, same combination, violin, gamba, and harpsichord with Monica Huggett and Mitzi Meyerson. And we really did do a lot. We what was that lot. group called? What were you? Trot was, group was called Trio Sonnery. Uh -huh. Later, we just called it Sonnery because sometimes yep. it was bigger than a trio or ensemble sonnery, but we did um, recorded, not all, but really a lot of that fantastic repertoire, Baroque chamber music repertoire with violin and gamba and continuo, Rameau and Books de Huda and Couperin and um, Ram uh, many, many other things. And then inviting also flute players, Wilbert Hazelzat played with us and um, singers, Nancy Argenta, and we did a Bach musical offering with um, uh, a, a bunch of people. Paul Goodwin was out, that was about his last oboe gig that he ever did before doing conducting full time. Mm -hmm. And then of course there were all the or London orchestras um, which were uh, doing really amazing stuff in all different sort of I would, I don't know if looking back, I'd say the styles were so different, but they seemed very different, different personalities of the directors, different approaches, although they mean the different London ensembles were different. The different London ensembles, were different whether, whether, you're, whether it's Trevor Pinnock and the English concert, whether it's John Elliott Gardner and the Monteverdi choir and so on, and, yeah. or, or, uh, Chris Hogwood. Hog, Chris Hogwood and the Academy of Ancient yeah. Music, Andrew Parrott and the um, Schutz Choir. Mm -hmm. So some of them were much more dyed in the wool, authentic, absolutely do the right forces and the right instruments. Some of them were more, you've got to, um, we want to do this at the, you know, just make it sound really good. And even though they all purported to be authentic, there is a whole uh, spectrum of how rigorous they wanted to be and and there were a lot of the usual suspects in all of those bands weren't there that's right yeah uh, perhaps more i think that gradually got less as there was more work and more players they, they mm -hmm. got more um 
loyalty to one band or another, but um, mm. it was, there was nothing like Tonto music where that was, you know, that you could just do that all year and nothing else. Everybody right. had to, had to play with everybody in order to, um, and there were also vile concerts getting going then. It was just when fretwork started and I opted not to join that group, but I did work with them from time to time, but I did join Jacob Lindbergh's group, the Dowland consort, and we did some great recordings with him for vials, things with, including viol and lute. Um, that Dowland concert, that was Wendy Gillespie and me and Alison Crum, oh. Trevor Jones, Richard Campbell. Uh, that's, that's it, five for Dowland. So um, Richard Campbell now sadly departed. Um, yeah, it's sort of, it, all this makes me not realize how long I've been around. So a lot of what you're talking about is recording projects. You've talked about all the bands in London, but did you do a, did you do a lot of concert work too? Was only when they needed gambas, uh, did you work in the orchestras or how did that oh, work? Oh, that's right. No, back in those days, I played violone as well. Uh -huh. And um, all over the place. Also with Ton Koltman, Amsterdam Baroque Orchestra in Holland, because Monica was leading that. So I played, and also with Bill Christie, Les Arts from time mm -hmm. to time. And in fact, uh, it was a, a Art Florissant gig in Cologne that I managed to score my beautiful antique violone, which I bought from Jay Bernfeld. Wow. Got, I mean, this is, I hope this isn't verging too close to the scurrilous, but he just got so fed up with um, uh, that that gig that he decided he was never going to do it again. And I, I won't be needing this said, thing that you want. I said, I'll buy it. And I had gone there by car. So I got to take it home. Um, oh, really, really, really beautiful 17th century original violone. But then, and I, in my turn, decided at some point I didn't need to do that anymore. I didn't mm -hmm. need to sweat about flying with it and like lug it around because I had enough work as a gamble player. Yeah. So I sold it to Sarah Grosser, who now has it in Ireland. Um, and we did a lot of touring, the Dowland project of playing all of the seven pavans of Lacrimae in one concert. Uh -huh. um, we did all over England and all over Europe. You might think it sounds like a gloomy project, but it um, flow my tears and all that. It was oh, so- Oh, but they're all visual pieces. Did People you play? Did you play all the other pieces in that same publication, or just the lugubrious ones? We did all the, the the other ones in the first half of the concert, the Alamans and the and yeah, the yeah, and, and, the, the, and a few yeah. of the pavans. But we did this whole second half of the concert was um, lacrime without a break. It's a forty-five minute thing. Wow. And there was one time we did it in Barcelona, and uh, the chairs were absolutely horrible. And by the time we got to the end. I found stood up to take a bow, and both of my legs were asleep. Oh. I had to sit right down. Again. <laughs> you just sat and smiled, huh? I did. <laughs> so if you, I mean, it sounds as though you've recorded all the music there is with all the ensembles are. I suppose you had to pick out two or three recordings of the, that you participated in that you would like to. I don't know, be remembered by, or that you remember the most, or both, or none. Pick out two or three sort of high points that you can think of. That's hard to do. And they're just going to be the ones that pop to mind because I am aware of them recently. There's our Rameau, Pièce de Clapsin en Concert is a really, really beautiful record. With? Uh, with, the tree, with Sonnery, with Trio Sonnery, but right. Bill Bert yeah, yeah. that played flute as well. Uh -huh. There's a, just not to dwell too much on, on Sonnery. There's a lot of good stuff there, but I love our Bach musical offering. We did do a six part Richard Carr with six instruments, as well as a harps on harpsichord on that disc and very creative renditions of the, um, all the canons. Wow. Um, I did um, the one recording, I mean, I did a number of Bach cantatas with John Elliott Gardner and, but the one that we did before the big cantata pilgrimage, yeah. when he did them all in 2000, we had earlier done the ones with Gamba, the Cantata 106 and 198, the Trow yeah. Road, yeah. with his group, with um, Richard Campbell and me, were the were the Gambas, and that is a really really special recording. I like, I think I like it better than the than the later and the pilgrimage version. one. Yeah, uh -huh. wow. that's amazing. So Sarah, how you you've been in this 
business, whatever the business is, early music, historical performance. I don't know. People seem to want to change the name. Everything that used to be called early music is now called historical performance. And I noticed the program in Bloomington changed its name. I noticed that anyway, whatever it is, if there is a thing there, what, do, what would you say has changed over the time you've been involved with it? I'll tell you the most striking thing is um, our attitude to new music for the old instruments. Mm -hmm. Because I know I really wasn't that interested. I was aware of it. I wasn't totally against it. My first teacher at Jan Silverger was a composer and I have played new music for it. But now I, over the time I came to feel it's essential if these instruments are alive now to be, to, ha to have them be part of what composers are, are composing for. And that kind of goes hand in hand with a somewhat changed approach to programming, which I must say I'm totally on board with, of not like a program has to be just focused on a particular period and a particular place so that you can really get into the feel of it and get all the right uh, things. I think um, it's much more interesting to link things by other um, themes than simply chronological. The Marlene Montgomery theory of I'm poetry. afraid so. It's kind of huh? complicated, Absolutely. but it's not just me. And plenty of people are, are doing, you know, it's like, no, I, won't, no, I won't say everybody, but a lot are, and I find it much more interesting. And I can even get on my, one of my little hobby horses here and say, I don't think we do music any favors by refusing to perform it unless we know exactly how it's supposed to be. Because number one, then it doesn't get heard and that's not doing the music a favor. And number two, we don't know and we never will know. And if we pretend that we know, that's much, much um, less, uh, well, less honest and less rewarding than if we acknowledge that we don't know and that we're, whatever we do, we're going to be bridging a gap between now and then. So we mm -hmm. may as well, you know, be straight up about that. That's great. I love it. I mean, it, it's sort of arrogant to assume that, you know, you know, yeah. I'll play Bach his way, that kind of thing. So, yeah. but you haven't said anything about the changes that have happened with respect to the demise of the CD. I mean, the, the, record, the recording world has changed enormously. And you haven't said anything about the rise of early music training in conservatories as opposed to sort of the private sector. Do you have any thoughts on either of those things? Um, sure. I just think that actually there's a turning point in my own career that sort of highlights that, which is that when I was uh, answered the phone, I was living in London at the time, and I remember it as April 1st, but I don't think it actually was. It just <laughs> felt like it because I answered the phone and, and the person said, hello, is that Sarah Cunningham? I said, yes. He said, this is James Galway. <laughs> and, <laughs> hmm. and oh, of course so it is. <laughs> he really wanted to play. He'd heard uh, our recording of Corelli, I think. And he wanted to do his Bach recording differently from everybody else. And he wanted me to come and play continuo and he wanted to use harpsichord and gamba. And that was kind of like a harbinger of the influence that the early music movement has had on music generally. Because mm -hmm. if you listen to almost any, many, many modern orchestras play classical music, it's different. And it's definitely been influenced by us. And um, so it's been, you know, just the whole, I think it's been a long curve of professionalizing the playing of it and popularizing the sound of it. And of it's hard, driven mostly by more and more musicians who fall in love with it and want to do it. And once you want to do it, then you have to create the work for doing it, for doing it. Now it's extraordinary that my students, anytime they almost any piece they want to learn, they can find 15 versions of it on, on YouTube. I mean, that is like still- And they can find the original materials on, on IMSLP. Well, exactly. Well, it's yeah. fantastic in a way. I think I deplore when they then say, oh, well, everybody was doing all the repeats, so I did too. Or, you know, the tempo, so-and-so, you know, they it's got- yeah. and 
inordinate influence, I think. Whereas if you were just finding it, reading through the whole collection and finding the piece that you like that way, rather than mm -hmm. like yeah. picking yeah. the one that you hear everybody doing. So what's your prediction for the future, Sarah? Good grief. Um, I, <laughs> uh, and the future is here. This is the future. What do you mean? <laughs> I think I'm kind of really embracing this notion of online performance. I know that we're going to just be so happy and like completely over the moon when we can play together in one room and listen together in one room again. But in the meantime, we found that you can cultivate a worldwide audience very directly and very easily. And I think that's incredible. Um, I love that. It still takes getting used to, but I feel as though it suits our music in, a, in the intimacy that you can just play from your own home to somebody else's home. And it is chamber music and it is salon music and it is, you know, doesn't belong in the concert, concert hall. I mean, we sort of inherited this concert hall structure from the 19th century. And uh, it's only gotten more rigid, and it doesn't really work that well for us. So in the future, we can bring music home. Yeah. And That's into smaller true. spaces, I hope. And okay. also to everybody. I have students at Juilliard who, in the wake of um, Black Lives Matter and the various protests, are just as passionate about bringing early music to Baroque music, historical performance, whatever you call it, to people who wouldn't get to hear it, to, especially to kids who can then have the notion of that as a possibility if they get, you know, really taken with it. And they're just as, as, as motivated for that as in like they're honing their own skills and their own musicianship. And I just think that's, um, that could be, it's very subversive and it could be really revolutionary in a good way for classical music to you know not be aiming high and you know doing this um wanting to have a great career but rather right. making music where you are for the people who need it but do well by doing good so there's a lot of good stuff in our future sure there is i'm glad to hear that sarah <laughs> coming in. thank you so much for this engaging and encouraging conversation i appreciate it very much Thanks, Very you know. nice talking to you, Tom. I Likewise. Really enjoyed it too.